All right, we're live. I think Joy is on her way, so she'll slip in. She may be a little bit. She's having a, you know, how teenagers are, <laughs> having a moment of uh, getting ready. But we uh, left off in John 2. I'm going to try to just get through chapter 3 today. I think we can cover that much, and then we'll still be on track to, to get to chapter 20 by Easter or on Easter. Uh, but kind of so far as an overview, just quickly, we based, so far we've been introduced to who Jesus is. Uh, the Apostle John has told us that Jesus is God. He's introduced us to who John the Baptist is. And John the Baptist has made it clear he is not the Christ, but who he's talking about is the Christ. And he points out that Jesus is the Lamb of God. It takes away the sin of the world. It says that twice so far in chapter 1. And then we looked at the kind of assembling and calling of the first six disciples. We've got James or John. We assume James is coupled in there. He hadn't mentioned that yet, but we know that through other gospel accounts. Uh, Peter and Andrew. And then uh, Philip was selected. And Philip went and got Nathaniel. And Nathaniel came and, and he was wowed by Jesus' ability to remember that story under the tree and then the miracle the uh, first miracle at the wedding of cana and now we're at uh, verse number 14 is about where we were and we're getting ready to see when jesus cleanses the temple uh, so that's kind of where we're at and it says after this uh, this is a uh, sorry chapter 2 verse 12 is where we are it says, after this, he went down to Capernaum, he and his mother, of course, this is after the wedding uh, miracle, and his brethren and his disciples, and they continued there not many days. And the Jewish Passover, or the Jews' Passover was at hand, and Jesus went up to Jerusalem and found a temple, found in the temple those that sold oxen and sheep and doves and the changers of money sitting. So basically the setup is they're going to the temple, and when they get there, they see a bunch of merchandising going on. It's, it's just turned into a lot of, um, what would we call it? Um, solicitation. Solicitation. Um, yeah, just it's, it's turned into something it shouldn't have been to begin with. They're just basically making money um, and turning it into quite the spectacle instead of focusing on worshiping God. So, yeah, in the Old Testament, of course, we have to keep that in mind. The Jews believed um, where they were told to offer sacrifices. So a lot of people would just show up at the temple. Many of them probably didn't have these animals that were required for the sacrifices, so they sold those types of animals there at the temple so they could just show up, buy what they needed, and then go offer it as a sacrifice, basically. But what has happened, evidently, is it's turned into a money-making scheme, and, and you know, as things usually always do, it turned into something it shouldn't. And it says... Verse 15, a lot of people take this a little bit out of context. They, uh, that happens in churches on people's narratives and interpretation. Um, so, so I've heard people say that this, this is borderline at least Jesus sinning because of what he does. But we know Jesus is sinless. If this was a sin, then we're all in trouble because his sacrifice would have done no good. <laughs> um, but we know Jesus is sinless all throughout the Bible. We read passages of that nature. And you know, a lot of people say, well, he just got angry and got mad. And in the heat of the moment, he went in there and started flipping over tables and all this sort of stuff. And that's not really the context. We see from 14 to 15, as the chosen points out, there's a lot of things that happen that aren't written. So I don't think Jesus walked around with a bunch of cords hanging on him. And it says, when he had made a scourge of small cords. So the idea is he most likely had time. You know, when we get mad in the heat of the moment, we're usually instantly going right into whatever it is. But Jesus had time to find cords, weave those cords into a whip, <laughs> and then go back to the temple. I doubt he kind of had them with him. And if they would have seen him making that right there in front of them, they probably would have left anyway. So it, the the idea that I have in my head anyway 
and most people agree with, is he went somewhere, got some cords, sat down, wove this whip, then went back and drove them out. So by that time, most rational people, at least, would have probably calmed down if this was done out of anger, mm -hmm. right? And they would have said, well, let's, let's make a better choice, you know, how we are with, you know, being diplomatic and stuff. And this is not just some normal person. This is Jesus. This is God. So mm -hmm. obviously what he did was not a, a simple reaction. It was something done through thought. It was something done he felt needed to be done. And what he did, he went and he made this whip. It's called a scourge of small cords. And he drove them all out of the temple and the sheep and the oxen and poured out the money's, uh, the changers' money and overthrew the tables. I mean, he cleaned house. He went in there and even got rid of the animals because he's like, I don't want anybody else coming in here and doing the same thing. I would assume the cord was for that. Right, yeah. You know, we don't know if he was whipping at people or whipping at the animals or what, what he was doing, but he used this cord, this whip, as we would interpret it, and he drove everybody out, including the animals, poured out the money, overthrew the tables, and he said to them that sold the doves, take these things here. He's like, get this stuff out of here. Make not my father's house a house of merchandise. And his disciples remembered that it was written in Psalm 69, 9 is the passage is talking about, the zeal of thy house hath eaten me up. And it's a, just a passionate drive to do what is godly and what is good. And they remember that particular verse as being, oh, this is the fulfillment of that verse of Jesus is doing this out of passion. He's doing this out of purpose. And we need to pay attention kind of to what the point was. So what do y'all think of that? I mean, what is y'all's take on that event have you ever I, I think the thing that at least where my mind is and I could be way wrong that what what is because it was in the temple as a exactly yeah I mean uh, they uh, were wanting financial money and then they were wanting sacrifices and then you shut the door it was all because they we're doing it. If that would have been outside, I don't exactly. Yeah, I would, wouldn't have think that would have happened. So, and that's my take on it as well. the The idea here is he's not doing this just because he's mad. He's not doing this for a selfish reason. He's doing this to honor God. He's doing this to honor his Father. And what comes to mind as well in the New Testament is Ephesians four twenty six. I've written that down in my Bible. Be angry and sin not. So there is the ability to be angry, but not sin in that anger. And I believe this is a perfect example of that. He was angry. It wasn't an immediate, you know, reactional rage kind of thing. He went and he thought about it. He's like, this is what I need to do. And he did it because that's not the purpose of the temple. The purpose of the temple is for worship. And he was simply making that statement. Then... He say, makes another big statement here. It says, Then the Jews said unto him. So there's obviously a crowd. We're, sorry, we're in John chapter 2. John 2. <laughs> um, verse 18. Yeah, we're in verse 18 right now. Uh, John 2, 18. So what's going on is obviously people are watching. I watched a video this morning of a guy. I forget where it was, but he was sitting in a school board meeting. The only one in there without a mask on. The mask mandate had been lifted. And this cop walks up behind him, grabs him by the back of the coat, and starts trying to drag him out of the meeting simply because he wasn't wearing a mask. But the mask mandate had been lifted, therefore he didn't have to have a mask on. He stood up, came out of his coat, and turned around and looked at the guy, grabbed the chair, and sat back down on the chair. He's like, I'm sitting here in this meeting. And three cops dragged him out of the room, literally, physically. And some people were screaming and hollering, what are you doing? You know, what? And they're using profanity and all this sort of stuff. So that kind of reminds me of this, is that there was an event that went on. It was quite a, a spectacle. And I'm sure a lot of the religious leaders were standing around saying, okay, now we've got him. He's done messed up now. <laughs> and they go to him, and they said, um, where are we at? It says, uh, Then answered the Jews and said unto him, What sign showest thou unto us, seeing that you do these things? He's like, 
tell us now, are, you know, are you, because he's claiming to be God, he's claiming to be Jesus, and he's, he says, the claim is, make not my father's house a house of merchandise. So right there, he's claiming to be the son of God within that statement. And they're saying, okay, show us a sign or evidence of what you just said. His response is, destroy this temple, and in three days I will raise it up. Of course, they're thinking, they're standing in the temple. So they're thinking he's talking about this structure, this temple, that, that they're all standing around. Of course, he's saying, okay, you're coming to attack me, destroy this temple, his body, is what he's talking about. And John, again, John, this is written 50 years or so after the event occurred. So he starts adding his own little commentary in here. He said, Then said the Jews, Forty and six years was this temple in building, and you will rear it up in three days. And here's his commentary. But he spake of the temple of his body. When therefore he was risen from the dead, his disciples remembered that they had said unto him, and they believed the scripture, which is referring to Psalm 69 9, according to my study notes in my Bible, and the word which Jesus had said, which is the statement of verse 19. So he's kind of going back in time and telling a story and then jumping ahead a little bit, saying, well, when he rose from the dead, they remembered what he said, which was this statement being made right here. And now he, when he was in Jerusalem at the Passover and the feast day, many believed his name when they saw the miracles which he did. But Jesus did not commit himself unto them because he knew all men and needed not that any should testify of man for he knew what was in a man. That phrase, did not commit himself unto them, simply meant he did not uh, tie himself to sitting down and having all these crazy conversations with what, you know, how can I help, what can I do, because he already knew the needs is kind of the interpretation of that little passage there. But that concludes chapter 2. Y'all got any follow-up or any thoughts about anything through there? Anything at all? Y'all can talk, by the way. We have some newbies in the room. Well, Lori's been here. Joy's joining us. Good to see her today. I'm talking to people online, by the way, <laughs> so that we know there's people online watching. Um, so let's look at chapter 3. I kind of want to focus on this and try to get through chapter 3. I think we can if we kind of peruse through it a little more quickly. So, again, the setup here. And you guys will see this. Have you seen this episode yet? No, it's the next one. Oh, the next one. Okay, so in The Chosen, they set this up where the Jews, because of all that they've seen, all of this word has gotten to the religious leaders, the Pharisees. And Nicodemus is one of those rulers. He's a leader of the Jews. It says that there's a man of the Pharisees named Nicodemus, a ruler of the Jews. So they arranged this meeting for him to come and talk to Jesus because, you know, with the Jewish custom, if, if anything out of sorts started to happen, they took action. It was like, you know, what we would call today church discipline. You know, you'd be brought before the church and, you know, confess your sins and then they decide what to do with you and all that sort of stuff. That's kind of the way the Jews handled things. Um, so he was going to Jesus to find out information about Jesus and who and what he is and the nature of himself and all that. And I think he was genuinely interested. I don't think he was coming in there just to catch him in something. Because later on we find that Nicodemus is one of the men who bargained to get the tomb of Joseph of Arimathea to put Jesus' body in the tomb. Nicodemus was one of the ones that helped in that instant. So I think he was genuinely looking for answers. And he comes to Jesus by night, it says in verse 2. And this is a big statement. Nicodemus, a ruler of the Jews and a Pharisee, says to Jesus, Rabbi. That word rabbi is teacher. I am now your student, you teach me. This is the leader of the Pharisees. He's like the biggest teacher in the area. And he's yielding to Jesus, calling him rabbi. So that's a big statement within itself. It says, we, meaning him and his pharisaical group, we know that thou art a teacher come from God, for no man can do these miracles except thou doest, or that thou doest, except God be with him. So they knew there was something different about him. He's paid attention to the miracles. He's seen them, and he knows something's going on. 
Jesus, and I find this very interesting. Again, to piggyback off of what verse 25 says of chapter 2, he already knew what's in the heart of man. Mm-hmm. Jesus doesn't even address that. He goes straight to answering a question that Nicodemus hadn't yet asked. <laughs> he says, he, Jesus answered, said unto him, Verily, verily, I say unto you, except a man be born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. He just jumps right into it because he knew why he really showed up. He wanted to know, you know, what's the answers here? How are we getting to heaven? And if I got something wrong, do you have something new to offer? Is basically the idea. And Nicodemus just rolls right with it. He says unto him, How can a man be born when he is old? Can he enter in the second time to his mother's womb and be born? And Jesus said, Verily, verily, I say unto you, Except a man be born of water and of the Spirit, he cannot enter into the kingdom of God. For which uh, that which is born of the flesh is flesh, and that which is born of the Spirit is spirit. So a lot of people take verse 5 and make a huge deal out of it. Um by reading in context, which I always try to do, the verses around the verse in question, what do you all take that as? First plus or thinking through it? says, except a man be born of water and of the spirit. And then he says, that which is born of flesh is flesh, and that which is born of spirit is spirit. What do you, what do you think that means, born of water? Your natural birth. I mean, that's what it seems to be implying here. Because he says that which is born of flesh is flesh. Now, a lot of people want to make that baptism, water baptism. And they say that this is the statement Jesus said. It's a requirement that you get water baptized or you can't go to heaven. And I don't think that that's what he's getting at here. Um, I think there's a purpose for baptism. Yes, the baptism is a symbol of you dying to yourself and rising again, walking in newness of life in Christ's direction. Uh, but this seems to be talking about physical birth. Now, a lot of people say, well, what about babies that weren't born yet? They died in the womb. Does that mean they can't go to heaven? And I think that's a far stretch of an argument to try to make. He's just pointing out that there is a physical aspect of your life and there's a spiritual aspect of your life. If you're born of flesh, if you're, if you're human at all, you have your own deal with that. But if you want to be born again, because they're talking about being born again. Nicodemus is saying, can you go back in your mother's womb and be born again? So they're obviously talking about physical birth or physical pregnancy or however far you want to take that in the conversation. He's just saying being born as a person in human form is its own thing. And that's not what's important. What's most important is being born of the Spirit. You've got to be born again or changed into a new creature, as we find out later in the New Testament. If any man be in Christ, he's a new creature. Old things are passed away. Behold, all things are become new. I think that's 2 Corinthians 5, something, 21 or something like that. Um, But I believe he's talking about physical aspects of life and then spiritual aspects of life. He says, marvel not that I said unto thee, ye must be born again. He's like, don't let this trip you up. This is not that difficult. You're a person, you're a person, but you can't get to heaven on your own. You've got to get to heaven through a new life in Christ, through a spiritual rebirth. That's my take on it. That seems to be the consensus of most um, you know, people who study this out for, for thousands of years. That seems to be the most logical explanation of these passages. Not He's talking about water baptism. That's a whole separate thing. I have read where Jews believe that Water was for cleansing. Mm-hmm. It was implying cleansing. Exactly. As to the okay, yeah, and that could be another take. So I don't, that there's I don't a physical know. cleansing and there's a spiritual cleansing. That could be another. I did read that in some of my notes as well. So either way you take it, I think that's what he's getting at is there's a difference in this world and the next is kind of his focus here. And then he says, because it's kind of a abstract concept, especially to the Jews because they hadn't really – heard any of this yet Uh, the wind bloweth where it listeth and you hear not the sound thereof but canst not go canst not tell where it comes from or where it goes so is everyone that is born of the spirit Um, I, i believe to get to the root of it is he's saying if he's talking about physical birth it's like that's not something you can see that happen immediately 
you'll see the results of that in a few months <laughs> as you know the woman starts getting a little bigger in the pregnancy. Same thing with being born again in the spirit. It's something that happens invisibly within a person's heart, but after it happens, you will see the results of that through the differences in their life, the way they talk, the way they walk, the way they think about things. There will be a change. And that's kind of what he's saying here is you don't know where the wind comes from. You don't know the point of origin of it, but you can see the results. You know, a lot of people say, um, you know, that they use that analogy of you can't see God, but you can see the results of him. You can't see the wind. I'll, I'll ask a lot of people, especially atheists, can you see the wind? They're like, yeah, I can see the wind. Like, no, you can't. You can't see the actual wind. You see the results mm -hmm. of the wind. Same thing with electricity, where sometimes we can see electricity yeah. <laughs> that sparks out. Uh, but that's the idea is this is something that happens in a private way, but then becomes a public result where people can see the difference in your life. And Nicodemus is, I can see him sitting there shaking his head, at least in his mind. He, he says, Nicodemus answers and said to him, how can these things be? And Jesus takes a little gut punch here. I don't think it was meant in, in malice, uh, but maybe jest. Jesus said, aren't you a master of Israel and you know not these things? <laughs> He's like, aren't you supposed to be a smart guy? I'm sure you can figure this out. So it's very, very, I say to you, you speak that, we speak that we do know and testify that we have seen and ye receive not our witness. It's like, I know what I'm talking about. I've seen the miracles. I've done the miracles. We've seen all these things happen. So we know what we're talking about. And you guys have not received our witness or our testimony that these things are true. It says, if I had told you earthly things and you believe not, how shall you believe if I tell you of heavenly things? And no man hath ascended up to heaven, but he that came down from heaven, even the Son of Man, which is in heaven. That phrase, Son of Man, again, goes back to the, the Daniel reference. And that's very clear that he's talking about the Messiah in that. And then here's a big statement, because who's he talking to? He's talking to a Pharisee, a Jewish leader, who studied the Old Testament scriptures and, and knew these things inside and out. He said, And as Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, even so must the Son of Man be lifted up. Now what he's talking about there is in Numbers chapter 21, verse 9, there's a story of Moses is leading the people to the promised land, uh, the people, of course, rebelling. They're not listening to God. They're just kind of doing their own thing. And there were vipers released into the camp of the people, and these vipers were biting people, and these people were getting very sick, and some of them were dying. So Moses is like, okay, God, you know, I'm following you, and now all this is happening. What do I need to do here? And God tells Moses, which is in the very beginning scenes of one of the episodes. I don't know if you've got to that one yet. It might be in the next one. You're going to watch. Um, he tells Moses, make a, a serpent. So these serpents are what's killing the people. He's like, make a serpent out of bronze, put it up on a pole, and tell the people to look at it. And if they'll do so in faith that God will heal them and save them from this, then they'll be healed and saved. And it happened, just as he said. So that's the backstory of that statement. And he says, as Moses lifted up the servant in the wilderness, of course, he would knew that Nicodemus would knew, know the story here, that whosoever believeth in him should not perish, but have eternal life. Um, oh, I skipped some. No, even so must the Son of Man be lifted up. So what he's saying is, I, like the serpent, will be lifted up, which he was on the cross. So as the serpent was on a pole, Jesus was on a pole, lifted up that whosoever believeth in him, or God, through Jesus, should not perish, but have eternal life. And then here's the big verse everybody always memorizes. is it. For God so loved the world, that he gave his only begotten Son, that whosoever believeth in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. So he makes this statement back to back. He says it again later towards the end of the chapter. So... You know, on Valentine's weekend, this is a perfect passage to talk about of God's love towards the world. Um, it says, for God so loved the world. Obviously, he's talking about the people in the world, not the worldliness of the world. Uh, but he loves everybody. It says that that he gave his only begotten son, that 
phrase only begotten, to point that out, means the only one, the special chosen one, the holy one of God, the only one who could have done this is what only begotten means. Uh, some other verses, which I take issue with, other translations, I should say, says that God loved the world in this way that he gave his one and only son. I take issue with that because we're also sons and daughters of God. Luke, I think it is, chapter 4, mentions specifically that Adam was the son of God because Adam had no other father. So theologically speaking, Jesus is not the one and only son. He's the only begotten son, the only one who could have done this. And, of course, he's talking about himself there. And then he tells the reason why. For God sent not his son into the world to condemn the world, a lot of people think Jesus came down here to beat everybody up over what they're doing, and that's not the case. But that the world through him might be saved. He that believeth on him is not condemned, but he that believeth not is condemned already, because he hath not believed in the name of the only begotten Son of God. So that makes it pretty clear why condemnation exists. It's not because God's mean and he's out to get people. It's because they haven't believed in this sacrifice come to save them from their sin. And therefore, the condemnation falls upon them by default. And verse 19 says, And this is the condemnation, that light, we've talked about that earlier on, that Jesus is light, God is light, that light has come into the world, and men love darkness rather than light because their deeds were evil. They didn't want to see themselves as the way God sees them. For everyone that doeth evil hateth the light, neither cometh to it, lest his deeds should be reproved or revealed, or they have to deal with it. But he that doeth truth cometh to the light, that his deeds may be made manifest, that they are wrought in God. Again, the whole point of this is to give glory to God and to yield everything to him. And even the good things that we do in the light of Jesus we don't take credit for, but we do it for the glory and the purpose of God. Pretty awesome passage. I love to get into that with people, especially non-believers, because it explains everything right there. Y'all got any takes on that or perspectives that you could share? I got something here that I've, I've heard for the first, or read for this, and it, it like really sunk into me, and it it's going. It's referencing what you're saying, but this is going back to verse 56. Mm -hmm. It says, um, "That which is born in flesh is flesh, and that which is born in spirit is spirit." But he says, "God had not intended to change the flesh, meaning the old nature that you have. In fact, the matter is that it can't be changed." Okay. Uh, it says, uh, "God has no program for your old nature uh, to re." treat it or improve it or develop it or to save it. The old nature has to go down in the grave there you go. and the new. <laughs> what a great way to explain yeah, it. Yeah, that is good. That is good. That is good. That you, you have to, and Paul talks about it over and over again, you have to die to yourself. Mm -hmm. and he says there, there was never meant to save you the way you are. That, that has to go. Yeah, you just totally yield and move wow. forward. Yeah. Come out of the darkness into the light kind of thing. That's awesome. All right, moving on. It says, After these things, Jesus uh, and his disciples came to the land of Judah, and there he tarried with them and baptized. So here we see the concept of baptism being pushed, that Jesus even baptized. Um, we see this down in verse 26. There's some debate over whether or not he physically baptized or just oversaw it, but the point is he was in favor of it. Uh, it says, And John also was baptizing in Enon near to Salim because there was much water there. And they came and were baptized. So here we have John the Baptist, the iconic John the Baptist, who started all this baptism stuff, and now Jesus, who is also baptizing. And there became this question among John's disciples about Jesus doing what John started kind of thing is a concept here. And it says, for John was not yet cast into prison. Again, that's another little tidbit of John, John the Apostle saying, now, John hadn't been thrown in prison yet, and that's why he's out there doing what he's doing. And there arose a question between some of John's disciples and the Jews about purifying. Maybe going back to the concept you were talking about, about purifying of the flesh, purifying spiritually, conceptually, baptizing, being raised you know, from your old self to the new. And they came unto John and said unto him, Rabbi, so here these people are calling John Rabbi, 
He that was with thee beyond Jordan, talking about Jesus, to whom thou bear witness. He talked about all that in chapter 1. Uh, behold, the same baptizeth, and all men come to him. So that gives us the picture that Jesus is baptizing, and people are going to Jesus to be baptized, and there's people still going to John to be baptized. And John's perspective is, hey, this is no longer about me and about my ministry. This is about following Jesus, and let's, let's give him this hour. Let's let him do his thing, and we just need to be happy for him. And, and be a part of this on a positive note. And that's basically what he says through these next verses. As John answered and said, a man can receive nothing except to be given him from heaven. So he was basically stating in that verse, all this stuff you've been seeing me do all this time, that wasn't from me. That was from God. God told me to do that through the Holy Spirit. And now Jesus is taking over. It's kind of like a you know, a sporting scout. They go out and do the hard work to scout the players, turn them over to the professional teams, and they just let them go, you know, or in music or whatever. It says, Ye yourselves bear me witness that I said I am not the Christ. He's like, remember when I said I am not Jesus, I am not the Messiah, I am not the Christ, but I am uh, sent before him. And he that hath his bride is the bridegroom. But the friend of the bridegroom, which stands and hears him, rejoices greatly because of the bridegroom's voice. This my joy, therefore, is fulfilled. Again, going back to this marriage concept that the the, the friend of the bridegroom, like the best man, I guess, if you will, of the wedding, doesn't stand there in jealousy the whole time. They're there to be happy for their friend who's getting married. And that's what Jesus has come to do is to establish his church. And the church is pictured as the bride. So we are to be faithful to Christ as a bride is supposed to be faithful to her husband is the idea. Jesus teaches that all throughout. Again, that's why I think his first wedding or his first miracle was fitting that it was at a wedding. I don't know if that's the reason that happened, but it definitely works into it. Then he makes a really big statement here. He meaning Jesus, must increase, but I must decrease. And that should be all of our attitudes. Put God first. Get out of the way. Do what he asks us to do. Yield to him. Don't make it about ourselves, but make it about God. And a lot of people, I fell into that for for a long time. I was kind of, you know, I talked about you know earlier in some of our lessons that I feel like that sin that thorn in my side was pride and arrogance and stuff. And I had to come to a point where I'm like, this has got nothing to do with me. Yeah, you know, I have got to just stop getting in God's way and just follow in everything and let him lead. And this is a perfect verse to learn from. He must increase, I must de- decrease. I can imagine myself, and I do at times, when people going to get in a biblical argument and argue about this and argue about that, I have to, in my mind, say, he must increase, I must decrease. Don't let this become about my knowledge, about my ability to do whatever, or just me in my moment of you know, heatedness. Let this settle. He must increase, I must decrease. I kind of have to tell myself that sometimes. It says, he that cometh from above is above all. This is where he's saying, Jesus is a much bigger deal than anybody else, and especially me. He that is of earth is earthly. And speaketh of the earth. He that cometh from heaven is above all. Says that twice there in one verse. And what he has seen and heard, that he testifieth, and no man receiveth his testimony. Going back to what he was explaining to Nicodemus a little bit. And he that hath received his testimony has set uh, set to his seal that God is true. For he for he whom God hath sent speaketh the words of God. For God giveth not the Spirit by measure unto him. You know, when we measure things out, I was making pancakes yesterday morning. I was measuring out stuff. Joy's got to do gluten-free stuff, so I'm measuring out, you know, all these different things. You know, when we measure something, what are we doing? What? Or limiting things, oh, okay. right? Okay. You measure it so you don't put too much into it. So we're limiting certain amounts of things. That's why we measure it. Cut this two by four, two feet long. You're measuring it so you don't cut it too long. You're limiting the length of it. And this is saying, for God giveth not the sp- giveth not the Spirit by measure unto Him. He's saying what God has given to Jesus is unlimited. 
and he's going to do with it what he needs to do with it. He's not limited. In essence, John is saying, I am limited as to what I can do. It's been measured to me to stop at a certain point. But Jesus, he's going to take this thing all the way, and it's poured out without measure. There's not going to be any limits given to him. The Father loveth the Son, and hath given all things to his hand. He And here he says this kind of final statement that summarizes John 3, 16 and 15. He that believeth on the Son hath everlasting life, and he that believeth not the Son shall not see life, but the wrath of God abideth on him. So going back to what Jesus was explaining, if you don't receive the Son of God, you don't receive salvation, you're going to face God's wrath. You're going to continue to live in darkness. And the only way for you to get out of that is to turn to Jesus. And that is, for Valentine's weekend, the love of God. And that's what he did for us, and I, I think it's pretty awesome. You all got any thoughts on anything as we close? I actually got that done in 40, 35 minutes. That's amazing. <laughs> but uh, any last thoughts, anything you jumped up on you? <laughs> yeah, I don't have any notes. I'm just, well, except what I've scratched down in my, <laughs> written down in my Bible, just using it as my notes. One night he was sitting on the couch, and I, he had like this big, huge stack. And I was like, <laughs> are you teaching on that in Sunday school? I was like, you're never going to get that done. It was like, Most of that stack is what's sitting on these yeah. tables, is the I handout. Know, I, was like, <laughs> I was like, for our opening session. <laughs> All right. Well, I'm going to close down the people online. Thank you all for watching. Happy Valentine's weekend, and we'll see you all next week. We're going to try to do chapters 4 and 5 next week for you all online, so be reading and studying that. We'll see you.